In the late 1940s, Chemie Grunenthal, a pharmaceutical company located in Stolberg, Germany, released the drug thalidomide into an unsuspecting market. Thalidomide was prescribed to hundreds of pregnant women as an over-the-counter remedy to alleviate morning sickness. However, the aftermath of its release resulted in over 24,000 babies being born with congenital disabilities. The thalidomide tragedy reformed the drug approval process not only in Europe, but in the U.S. as well. In recent years, research has shown that thalidomide can also be used to treat deadly diseases, proving how past medical tragedies can lead to future triumphs. In 1946, following the end of World War II, Hermann Wirtz set up the West German pharmaceutical company, Chemie Grunenthal. Wirtz was part of a post-war network of German scientists and businessmen who had played leading roles during the Nazi reign. Because of his background with the Nazi party, the company became a safe haven for labor camp scientists and doctors looking for work. For example, immediately after the war, Grunenthal employed Heinrich Muchter as chief scientist. Muchter was sought in Poland on charges of war crimes after conducting medical experiments in prison camps, in which hundreds may have died. The pharmaceutical company went on to develop the drug thalidomide, which was initially meant to be used as an anti-nerve gas agent. However, after satisfying results during testing, the pharmaceutical company claimed that thalidomide could also be used to treat insomnia and nausea associated with pregnancy in hopes of increasing profits. Because there were few regulations governing drugs in Germany, Grunenthal claimed they had completed testing, but did not actually have to perform tests or prove the safety of the drug during pregnancy. Thalidomide first entered German markets in 1957 under the brand name Contragan as an over-the-counter remedy for anxiety based on the maker's safety claims. Grunenthal advertised the drug as completely safe and innocuous even during pregnancy. During a time when nearly one out of seven Americans consumed sedatives regularly and demand in some European countries was higher, the presumed safety of thalidomide gave the drug massive appeal. Within a few years, thalidomide was sold and distributed in 46 countries under 52 trade names, with sales nearly matching those of aspirin. In Australia in the late 1950s, obstetrician Dr. William McBride discovered that the drug also alleviated morning sickness. He began prescribing this off-label use of the drug to his pregnant patients, sparking a global trend that served as a marketing strategy for Grunenthal. As consumption of the drug increased among mothers, the number of miscarriages and deformities in the delivered babies concurrently increased, which began to raise questions about the drug's safety. In 1961, McBride and German pediatrician Dr. Wittekind Lenz made independent observations linking the so-called harmless compound in thalidomide to the deformities in the babies they delivered. Thalidomide was thought to have inhibited the development of new blood vessels at a crucial stage in the pregnancy. The drug interfered with the baby's normal development, causing many of them to be born with focomelia, or in other words, shortened, absent, or flipper-like limbs. This arm doesn't bend. It's just one straight bone, and I have three fingers that don't really grip. And then on this hand, I have a thumb, but that's because I was born with four fingers, and the doctor took my finger and turned it this way and made it into a thumb. Their findings were confirmed by multiple other cases worldwide. Kemi Grunenthal failed to provide convincing clinical evidence to refute these emerging concerns. After German newspapers reported that 161 babies were adversely affected by thalidomide, and Dr. McBride published an article about the unusual focomelia cases in The Lancet, Drug makers, unable to ignore the reports any longer, finally stopped distribution. By March of 1962, thalidomide was banned in most countries where it had been sold extensively to expecting mothers. On March 13, 1967, the state prosecutor for North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany issued a criminal complaint against 18 executives and scientists from Grunenthal. The Contragan trial, as it was dumped, began in January 1968 and ended two and a half years later after 60 experts and 120 witnesses provided reports, testimonies, and underwent cross-examination for the dangers of the drug. However, state prosecutors ultimately dropped all charges in exchange for Grunenthal's agreement to establish a fund for the affected children. In the final written decision, the court ruled that thalidomide had indeed caused the congenital deformities. But to this day, Grunenthal continues to shy away from legal liability. Around the world, roughly 24,000 infants were born with characteristic abnormalities related to thalidomide consumption, and over 40% died within their first year of life. These abnormalities included hearing loss, facial paralysis, malformations in the lungs and heart, brain defects, and other developmental deformities. Some midwives purposely let limbless babies die. Some parents went mad or abandoned their infants to charities or the state. 
Others resign themselves to lives of quiet desperation and anonymous heroism. The babies didn't have it much easier. Of the 50% that survived, many were faced with lifelong hardships. The babies' flippers were often amputated so the children could be fitted with prosthetic limbs. These prosthetic devices made it difficult to participate in everyday activities. Across the Atlantic Ocean in the United States, tragedy was averted because of a reviewer for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In September of 1960, Dr. Francis Oldham Kelsey, a new medical officer at the FDA, was faced with her first task, reviewing thalidomide. It just so happened that my first application was for the drug thalidomide. I got this because I was new and they thought I should have an easy one to start on. By this time, the drug had been widely sold in Europe and the approval seemed almost certain and easy. But Kelsey was hesitant to approve thalidomide, as some of its data and limited tests troubled her. The drug's U.S. manufacturer, the William S. Mayo Company of Cincinnati, lobbied furiously, calling Kelsey a petty bureaucrat and complaining to her bosses. Nevertheless, Dr. Kelsey persisted and blocked the drug's use, saving countless American infants from a certain medical disaster. In 1962, the FDA set up a branch to test and regulate new drugs, and Dr. Kelsey was put in charge of it. Concern over the tragic effects of the new sedative thalidomide prompts President Kennedy at his press conference to call for stronger, better administered drug laws. During the same year, the Kefauver Harris Drug Amendment was passed, tightening restrictions surrounding the approval process for drugs to be sold in the U.S. and requiring that manufacturers prove they are both safe and effective before they are marketed. The FDA also created guidelines for preclinical animal tests to learn if a new compound caused birth effects before human use. In a distinguished 45-year career with the FDA, Kelsey helped to rewrite the nation's medical testing regulations. These rules have since been adopted worldwide and have strengthened protections for people against medical conflicts of interest, illustrating the triumph of a federal agency against big pharma companies. Due to the vast amount of negative publicity associated with the drug, Research into its potential use stopped for a period of time. However, in 1964, a leprosy patient at Jerusalem's Hadassah University Hospital was given thalidomide when multiple other painkillers and tranquilizers failed. The doctor who prescribed thalidomide noticed that the skin lesions caused by the disease were significantly reduced. Research into thalidomide's effects on leprosy resulted in a 1967 World Health Organization clinical trial in which positive results were observed. Though the initial rejection of thalidomide spared countless American infants and sealed the agency's reputation as the finest consumer safety authority in the world, the drug was reapproved nearly four decades later in July of 1998. Several precautions were implemented, such as the STEPS program, that aims to control and monitor access to thalidomide in hopes of preventing another tragedy from reoccurring. Over 35 years after the effects of thalidomide horrified the world, the drug is teaching researchers a new set of lessons. The tragedy of thalidomide was a significant historical turning point in drug testing and regulatory oversight. Major regulatory reforms were passed in many European countries and around the world that are still in effect today. This medical tragedy has proved that in difficult situations, government agencies such as the Food and Drug Administration are indeed beneficial and essential to the well-being of people. Among global drug regulators, the FDA remains at the top of the list, and its distinguished reputation is one that other agencies around the world look up to. Prior to thalidomide, drugs were rarely tested for teratogenic or embryonic effects. The global distribution of thalidomide brought about awareness of the side effects of a drug on pregnant women. Furthermore, thalidomide has encouraged scientists to pursue important new compounds to treat deadly diseases, even those that can cause birth defects. Today, pharmaceutical firms need to consider both the direct and indirect effects of a drug through advanced medical testing before expanding research on dangerous yet badly needed drugs to treat diseases. Currently, thalidomide is used to treat medical disorders such as leprosy in developing countries, AIDS, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis. In addition, this drug acts as a chemotherapeutic agent for patients with multiple myeloma or cancer of the plasma cells in bone marrow. The recent triumphs of thalidomide against deadly diseases are now masking its once tragic history. We now look to a future of safe drug regulation. What we have to do is worry less about what's wrong with us and worry more about what is right. Celebrate every day because it's worth it. It's worth it. Life is wonderful.